Uh, adapting from novel or story to screenplay and uh, vice versa. Yeah. So I guess probably the first thing that we need to do is introduce ourselves. Let's start on the end down there. Okay, uh, my name is Eric Wilson and the reason I'm here is because I actually wrote novelizations of existing films that were kind of uh, small market successes and so they decided let's make a book out of this and monetize it in some other fashion. So I'm I'm the vice versa part that they refer to in the title, I think. Okay. Yeah, I'm so sorry. I didn't realize the previous group had finished. I've been sitting out there, yes, yeah. Um, yeah, my name is Maura Heafy, and uh, I am the author of a volume called 100 Most Popular Science Fiction Authors. And I think the reason I'm here is kind of, uh, Probably not as many of these authors who I would like to see have had their their movies, uh, their books made into movies, and possibly wondering why, when there's such a great uh, resource out there, why filmmakers haven't done more with classic science fiction uh, stories. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry, please just go ahead. My name is Mike D'Ambrosio. I'm the author of the Space Frontier series, uh, an adult horror story called Night Creeps, uh, based on stories I got from conventions and bars, and part of the Time Trilogy. Uh, I also have been writing screenplays for the books, and you know, there's a couple that I'm waiting to find out what's going to happen with, but um, you know, as of yet, you know, it's just you know, some like, quite small projects. So uh, hopefully, we'll see something on that. Okay. You please. Oh, uh, David Blaylock. I wrote the book Ascendant and it was turned, it was adapted to uh, the movie Sword Bear, which is going to be shown tonight. It's an independent 22, 22 minute film. Is that the one that Summer did? Yes, that's the one Yeah, Summer I saw read. that at Marcon. That's very, very well done. Thank you. Uh-oh. Uh your skirt just Your skirt came just came out. Oops. Oops. I hate it when my skirt drops every time. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> if you had better looking legs, we're going to have to hit that buzzer who's going to tell the next joke. It was the Bonnie Knee kind of thing. I thought we were going to have a stress. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I'm Frank Friedel. I'm the writer of Space Frontier. Uh, an author, filmmaker, and uh, publisher. Yeah. So, yeah. I've got uh, my toes in three different worlds. Yeah. 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 Y
when I first started working on the script for a fraction of time, um, they were able to enlighten me on quite a few things that about the screenplays that you really have to know. They are two different animals, the books and the screenplay. It's, it's, it's almost like having two more full-time jobs. Um, I think uh, because I've gone from the novels to the screenplays, it's, you really have to go into open-minded that you're going to have to change a lot of things. Um, there's budgetary things, the number of characters, number of locations, a lot of things. That, I mean, there's a whole lot of things that come into play. And you have to, it's your baby, but you have to be willing to cut. Yeah, <laughs> you know, cut it's and, and sometimes it's merging two characters. I mean, it, and sometimes it's based on what, what the, the producer wants. I mean, he may say, I want this character to go from male to female. I want this character to be screwed up in the head. I mean, you, you don't know what you're going to get. Um, but it's so, it's so hard because there's so much material in a book. And basically, you have to almost break it into a skeleton, like the beginning, and middle, and end. Like you have your plot points. I mean, these are the same things if you set the plot points and then you fill in the gaps from there because there's a lot, like probably 8% of the story in the book you're not going to be able to use. And then in a lot of cases, the script is going to be a bit different from the book. And you have to keep in mind that the producer, he has to feel passionate about that script. If he doesn't feel the passion for it, it's not getting made. So uh, going from, from, from the book to the screenplay is very difficult. And I recently finished a screenplay um, that uh, um, I actually started doing the novel for it, and I found it to be a heck of a lot easier. Because I, I know novels, and I'll go from the screenplay to the novel, I could, a lot of the things that I wish I could have put in the screenplay but didn't have the room for, now I can have a lot more fun going into. Uh, so, but in that respect, like I said, there, there's, real, there's a lot of things you have to take into consideration. I said, uh, a lot of it has to do with the budgets. Anything that's going to impact the budget, um, you're probably going to hear they want, they want changes on it. And you know, if you understand that from the beginning, it's a heck of a lot easier. So it, it took a little bit. It uh, took a little bit of Ron Picardi to understand. It's not going to be the way I wrote it. And uh, you know, so far, you know, I've gotten a lot of good responses from it. And uh, like I said, I've been fortunate. I've had a number of producers have actually taken time to sit down, show me things, explain how the business works, and things that you know that would help me in the future with them. So uh, yeah. So now I'm in, in the holding pattern for two of them to see what's going to happen uh, with uh, a couple of you know, companies that are pretty interesting. I think that you hit upon a really interesting point. There was one word that you used that really kind of defines, if you're a novelist going into this, why it's different for you, in that you have an unlimited budget. You can write set pieces that, I mean, you can write those all day long. You know, that whole scene with the Balrog on the bridge with Gandalf, you can write that <laughs> stuff all day long. You know what I mean? But if you're going into the independent film market, that film's never getting made. Yeah. No. You know, so I mean that's definitely one of the things where, like, especially if you're doing the novelization of it, I mean, it's like, well, that's easy. Yeah. You know, like they already had the budget. Like you're just, you can ramp it up. You can put in stuff that they didn't have, and, and take that up a notch. But you can't go the other way. In my case, I had uh, had readers read the book, not realizing the movie was my source material or the screenplay was the source material, and they'd read the book and say, "Oh, I wish they had included that in the movie, but probably because of the budget, they couldn't." <laughs> and I just no, I didn't. Even, well, actually, I added that to their story, but right. but that's why I was there. So does that answer some of your question as to why some things aren't made? Oh, absolutely, yes, uh, yes, and I, I think uh, you know it is uh, it is a problematic thing in terms of the scope of imagination that you've got with some of your classic science fiction authors, you know, that, uh, yes. Well, I'll yeah. say that the, uh, the other thing that immediately went to my mind when you were asking why more of these things aren't adapted, mm -hmm. and this was the thing that was very different for me coming into, into the film industry, was that I was under the impression that we were in the business of making movies, and mm -hmm. that's not so. Yeah. We're in the business of marketing movies. Right, right. And if I can't sell it, I'm not going to get mm -hmm. funding for it. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, if I can slap Philip K. Dick's name on something, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, everything yeah. from the Minority Report to Blade mm -hmm. Runner, mm -hmm. well, I can get funding. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But Richard Matheson, fantastic author. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. And like they did I Am Legend, which yeah, is, yeah, yeah. but they're not touting that as Richard Matheson's no, I Am Legend. No, no, no. Like they do totally everything else yeah. as Philip K. Dick's mm -hmm. so and so. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's yeah. that's a lot of why that's yeah, not happening. They can't sell it. Yes. You know, yeah. they're, in a, they're in a pitch meeting with producers out mm -hmm. in California, and mm -hmm. it's like, you know, we've got this great science fiction story. Yeah. Um, you know, one of my favorites, like uh, uh, The Cold Equations by Tom Godwin, a great short story, mm -hmm. would adapt very, very well. Matter of fact, they, they yeah. ultimately did adapt it for The Twilight Zone. Yeah, yeah. But you walk into a, a meeting like that and say Tom Godwin, no one knows no, what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's not what you can do, it's what you can sell. Mm -hmm. So, you're saying even if in the writing world, somebody's got somewhat of a name, 
but you go into you know big producers and people whatever else and they don't know that name that's going to affect your budget there i mean they, they're not going to check into oh in the literary world this guy's like you know phenomenal well the thing is is that there are you know th these people have people who whisper in their ear you know if i walk into a meeting and i want to pitch a, a, a project for dc comics or let's say the old wildstorm you know jim lee was the creator of this particular character this suit might not know who Jim Lee is, but the guy sitting next to him is going to lean over and go, that's big. You know, yeah. that Jim Lee's big. He can sell. You know, like, J Jim Lee by name alone will sell something. You know, if I, yeah. you, you, you can get, I could sell Jim Lee's cocktail napkin. I could sell that all day long. You know, but, you know, it's the reason why Alan Moore, like, every single thing that he's doing now is being adapted. You know, yeah. the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen started off, then there was Watchmen, and V for Vendetta. I never thought I'd see V for Vendetta on the screen. Yeah. Except that he had already done other things, and he was becoming a well-known property in Hollywood. They knew they could sell. Yeah. So, do you have anything that I know you've got a screenplay waiting for waiting in the wings, as it were? But do you have anything that you would like to produce as a screenplay or as a novel that you're hesitant to do because you're afraid it wouldn't go across the way you feel like it should? I think probably the hardest one was probably the, the adult horror one, Night Creeps, because I had to modify that quite a bit. Um, and it was a little different for, for me, because most of my stuff is written for young adults on up. So it's relatively clean. Um, you know, Night Creeps has a lot of, some, some coarse material in it. And it's a side of me that I don't know, I'm not used to showing. And uh, my biggest thing was, you send it out there and somebody says, what are you, some kind of freak? You know? <laughs> and, uh, it just seems like it's, it's as big a world as it is, it's a very small world, and it's easy to get reputations for being good at things, and it's also easy to get a reputation for being bad at something. Um, Do you have trouble writing? I, I have a problem with um, writing something that I like. I like to read that in my writing. I like to read that in other people's writings, but if I go to show that to you know a publisher or somebody else, they're wild, you know, you, you're getting too, this guy recently called it, High def, you can, you know, or you know, we don't need this to go HD for this. You know, you tone it down is what I'm saying, and or, you know, smooth it over, whatever else. Not quite so bold and in your face, but I like to read bold and in your face. And if I pick up somebody else's book, I want to read it there too. So, wh what do you do with that? Because that really almost seems to be one of my biggest problems. It's like tone this down. I don't want to tone that down. You know, I, I want it to blow up in your face, and you know. That's where you have to you have to research your publishers and your producers before you submit to them. Um, and like you probably know, it's like I mean, if, if you if you like to do certain types of movies, and some if, if you let's say you never do comedy, you do everything else but comedy, and somebody keeps sending you comedy, right. it's like I don't do comedy. I don't want to yeah, do comedy. Yeah. Um, I like to look look these people up, see the type of things they've done, and I'll, I'll look and see like you got to be honest with yourself. Sometimes your material just doesn't fit somebody's agenda. Right. Um, sometimes your style, like you say, for the type you like, uh, some producers aren't going to do that. I mean, Quentin Tarantino likes in-your-face stuff. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, exactly. somebody like that. But that's and, and, and Quentin Tarantino is, like, you know, phenomenal, right? He's like, everything he does is almost just about going to make money. It can be so why don't more people pick up anything. on that? That in-your-face makes money. What, you know? Well, do because you know it's a special market. It's a specific market. The market uh, is what drives industry. Yeah, Quentin Tarantino's stuff does not appeal to the same people who go to see uh, Twilight. <laughs> Twilight. <laughs> or, you know, uh, what is it? Uh, uh, deep fried tomatoes or whatever. Uh, fried yeah, green tomatoes. tomatoes. Fried green tomatoes. Uh, you know, every market has its particular niche. Right. You like the in-the-face type violent, you know, stuff that uh, is it's the macho, kill will kind of stuff. But that's not everybody's Right, and so the market, the uh, producers have to pick the one that they think will be most Good beneficial for them, and they then will accept those scripts. Right. And it's just to find those it's people that are, those you know, that are looking for that. You know, their goal. I mean, if you, if you're pitching this as a script to someone else, all they care about is can I make money from this? Return on investment. It, it, it's all it is, and I mean, like you know, the simple fact is, is that if you know, if shooting the guy in the chest instead of the head is going to sell 500 more tickets, <laughs> Kid, shoot him. That's the way I'm going to shoot it. I mean, it's you know, my my goal is to make everybody involved as much money as possible. Not to mention the fact that I mean, the better you do on this film, the more budget you get for the next film, the better your stars.
Do you have a suggestion as to finding, like, for example, I watched several HBO and Showtime uh, shows. It, there are a lot of that is right there in your face. And I'm looking at, you know, I've got two books out. I'm working on my third, and I'm just thinking, this would be such a great series on one of those, HBO or Showtime, something like that. How do you go about knowing who to get in touch with that you can get them to look at your stuff? That's a, that's a tricky thing. Yeah, it's, that's tricky. There's because that's all shaking hands and kissing yeah, babies. Yeah, it's networking. All, yeah. Everything is networking. Right. From the time, whether you're writing scripts, whether you're writing poetry, or whether you're just writing, mm -hmm. you know it's all networking. It's oh, not. Yeah. It's not pretty much what you know. It's who you know. Right. And but you so, got to know the right group to go and get to know. Right. Yeah. But yeah. you got to do some kind of research. You gotta, well, I'm just you know, thanks for that. Hey, so you guys know somebody. You know. See. <laughs> One of the things that I'll say is that, I mean, like, you know, if your work is, is so unique or so in your face that it's like, you know... But it's not overly... Well, I It's mean, got like, certain scenes, you know, it's you not like the whole thing is... Are you familiar with the artist Mark Crumb? Anybody? No. Yeah. Mark Crumb? Yeah. Okay, I don't like his work at all. But it's really unique. And it's like, you know, that is certain, that's a strong cup of coffee. That's, you know, you, you got to acquire that taste. Yeah. But people who like it really like it. You know, but finding someone to publish it is something else. Now, if you want to make your own way, that's one thing. Like, I made my bones by doing superhero prose. I took superheroes out of comic books, and people were like, I don't, I don't even know what that is. I, I, what do you do? A what? They're like, open up the book, and they're like, I don't, I don't get it. Did, did the pages fall out? What happened? Like, I'm like, I don't know. It's superheroes in a literary setting. Where it's, right. You know, it's a special... Okay, never mind. Just, you just go to the next table, Mr. You. <laughs> so... But I mean, you make your own way. You know, it's uh, you know, you do what you love to do, and I believe you'll find an audience for it. That's always been my model. I'm sure the others find. Yes, ma'am. Can you go to the library and research the agents? And I know it just gives names and addresses. But after you research them, is there another source that you can go to and see what they're interested in? The, the motion picture industry is very cliquish. Well, I realize yeah. that. I mean. Anything that you see in the library is probably dated because uh, as, as much turnover as there is and as volatile as the industry is, the person that you read about in a, in a book in the library, probably you know, even if the book was printed last year, probably hasn't been there for six months. So using the internet, I guess, is about as up to date as you can get. Well, when you were asking if there was another resource, yes, it's called Blockbuster or Netflix. Right. You find out the stuff that they're producing, and it's like, oh, those are the kind of things that they like? That's where you go. I mean, that's your research. As far as names go, you can probably get it from the credits. So. Absolutely. Yeah. As far as books, the only book that I've found somewhat helpful has been like the Hollywood um, Directory of Producers, and there's also the Hollywood Directory of Agents. And they say a lot of times, by the time that book comes out, like some of the email addresses you can query to, they're no longer good. Um, but I have gotten a lot of good information out of that. Um, uh, I subscribe to a couple of websites. Inktip.com has been pretty good. Um, I subscribe where they send you leads. They're posting you eight or nine leads every week. Um, I've gotten a couple good hits with that. Um, most of it is just being places. Like I go out west a lot, like when I'm at Los Angeles for Lost Con or some of those, Comic Con even in San Diego, you get a lot of movie people there. And sometimes just doing a panel or having a table uh, you run into people in the strangest places. Um, the one company from London that's interested in my script for a fraction of time, I met the woman that's a financial officer in Orlando earlier this year when I was doing a book signing. And I didn't know who she was, and so she wanted to look at all three books. We had a conversation going about it, and then she said, you know, there's a screenplay for this. I said, yeah. I said, there's a screenplay and a TV series for each book. She goes, how would you know that? And I said, well, I wrote it. <laughs> and she starts, she starts telling me who she is, and I'm like, Holy crap! <laughs> and also, uh, so that's kind of got this ball going for for this book right now. Um, but like I said, going out places and networking, um, you know, some, you'd be surprised the people you can talk to that you know sometimes they know people, sometimes uh, they're related to people. You, you just have to be there. Yeah. The conventions. I I actually two years ago went to a film convention and just recently signed a deal with a guy I met at that film convention. Two years ago. Yeah, you know, and we had kept up with email and just, I mean, it wasn't anything pushy on either one of our ends, but it just, we kept the relationship. And another guy, I went to a film screening at Vanderbilt. I live in Nashville. And I went to this film screening. It was a film that seemed interesting to me. And 
and I met the guy who had done the, it was the director of photography, and we ended up finding out we lived fairly close to each other, got connected, now we're going to Destin next week together for vacation with our wives. I mean, you know, so I like yeah. these connections, and then you never know where they're leading it. And you can't, I mean, for me personally, my style is I can't go into it thinking this is gonna lead somewhere. It has to be a true relationship that I'm gonna enjoy, whether it ever becomes professional or not. Some people are better at that marketing side, but I, I have to feel <laughs> genuine about it, otherwise yeah. it comes across ingenuous, right. I guess, or disingenuous. Yeah, I have a question. What was your name again? I'm sorry. Mike. Mike. Uh, when she was asking about that, I have a friend named Gina Ellis who writes screenplays, and I had done that script frenzy thing and written um, a modern answer to looking for Mr. Goodbar, and, um, and she wanted me to put it on some website, and it was ink something, and I was wondering if it was that ink tip, so if you had written a, a screenplay, you could pay like 10 bucks and put it on the website, and then um, independence, and sometimes the big boys actually will browse through there and read your log line and stuff. Have you ever used that for, you, yeah, you know what which what it's called, because I can't remember, I've had it written on my computer. It's inktip.com. Yeah. And uh, they also have, like, so you can have that reposted, and you also have where, um, I think, I forget what they call the other program they have, where they actually send you, um, every week I'll get like eight or nine leads, different companies, what they're looking okay. for, and if any of mine fit that, then I can, I, they give you a code you log into, and you can tell them, you know, basically you get some in a short sign. Okay, so that's the one where you can actually post your screenplay for people to take a look at. Yeah. yeah. Are you registering your script with the WGA before you do well, that? Well, I haven't done it yet, because, um, it has a montage in it that I'm not satisfied with, and I was waiting, and I was going to talk to my because she has she's won some awards. She did a thing called Angela's Decision that was done by an Aussie company, um, and I can't remember the star is now doing something big in Aussie TV that was in that. It was like her stepping stone, yeah. and Gina's real active, and I was going to go back to her and ask her about those kind of things before I did anything else, but I, I, there's one little piece of it I want to work on before I send it. And I think, I'm afraid it's going to get picked up by a porn company, because it's, it's <laughs> got, it really, it's got an, an awful lot of stuff that it could just be turned into a pornographic film, and I haven't decided if I want to put it out there. Because right. if, if you all remember looking for Mr. Goodbar, it was pretty hot at the mm -hmm. time. Right. And mine is hotter. Because of, <laughs> times have changed a little. So. Well, whatever you do, my advice to you for whatever it's worth is simply protect yourself at all times. Oh, um, sure. I'm a lawyer. The, I actually yeah, sort of knew The that. second I write Fade to Black on, on, on my first draft, I upload that script to the WGA. And if I make a revision later on, I re upload and I pay it 35 bucks again. Yeah. Like, I cover myself at every step of the way. And you don't have to be, you just pay for it. You don't have to be like a, a member of a group or something no. to do that. Okay. No, no, no. No, they're there to protect the writer's rights. You know, even people who aren't a member of their organization, you're paying, I mean, you're paying to register the script. This way, if you know that movie gets made two years from now, you're like, wait a minute, that was my script. Uh, how do you prove that? Yeah. Well, I have my WGA registration number from two years ago. Mm -hmm. That's how I prove it. It's very rare that anybody would actually try to steal a script, and I didn't, you know, because the repercussions of that could be really bad for a company. But uh, the one that comes to mind was Siriana, George Clooney's company. Um, one of his employees. A girl sent his girlfriend was from Australia sent the script in, and the guy was getting ready to quit. It. Took her name off of it, didn't change anything. Put his name on it, and uh, they made the movie, and that became a big deal. That went to the world court, and uh, Clooney's attitude about it was, "Wait a minute!" He goes, "I had no idea." I mean, he he didn't want any parts of anybody stealing any, uh, any kind of property, so he was more than happy to compensate her to take care of her and all. And uh, I believe they went after the the, the ex-employee, you know. Uh, for the whole thing for fraud and uh, theft and all, but uh, that was the case where I mean it's somebody famous that we all know, and it, you know that occasionally it does happen. But you know, like the it's it has to be the actual script because I know uh, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Sandman Slim by Richard Cadry, really cutting edge dark fantasy, it's great stuff, and uh, they did Nicholas Cage when he's doing all these movies, did one that was that was conceptually the same character was called something different and the script was, was different, was similar but different. And I'm like, God, they just they just ripped off Richard Cadry, but of course he had not written a screenplay, he'd written a novel, and it was different enough and they didn't steal the name of his character. But when I went to saw that movie, I thought, God, this just there's, really sucks. But, so you know, but you can do that, yeah, yeah, you can do that. So. 
Somebody must have read, but I'm sure that somebody read Sam and Slim and went, damn, that would make a fine movie. And when when Lost script. first came out, the first episode of Lost, that night I must have got 300 phone calls from people that said, they stole your story. Yeah. And I'm like, what are you talking about? And, I was, and when I went back and I got a chance to see it, I'm like, that's not really, I mean, it, you can think hard enough that you want it to be the same, but I mean, realistically, I mean, there's a lot of stories out there that people, with so many people writing, there's going to be a lot of similarities. Parallel evolution. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you yeah, just have to happens be. Happens a lot. You know, it's <laughs> even happening in Darwin. Yeah. 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 And there's well, lots of chance somebody, maybe they did copy a character, but you know what? Unless it's really blatant, like in the case of like with Siriano, what happened, and, yeah, where it's the whole script, it's not worth the time and money to fight about it. Right. That's, so, well, you know, it's Forrest Gump. I don't know about Forrest Gump, but one of the things I did find funny was that, I mean, after the fact, if you ask George Lucas or Steven Spielberg, that scene in Raiders of the Lost Ark or with, the, with the idol and the sandbag mm -hmm. is from a Scrooge McDuck comic book mm -hmm. from the 40s, <laughs> which they had read as a kid, and they were like, just always remember that they put it in the script. But it's lifted bodily. I mean, these are the guys stealing. I mean, it's George Lucas, and you're like, are you kidding me? But yeah, I mean, it's it's inspired by. It. It's yeah. not stolen. Yeah. Well, that scene was like in the Transformers too. One of the Transformers, they had almost that identical scene, and I'm like, good God, this is you know, this is Raiders of the Lost Ark. Well, now, <laughs> now though, of course, it's an homage. Exactly. Now, exactly. people look at it and either you know think of the uh, Indiana Jones or the Scrooge McDuck, you know, whichever. Well, but I think that your chances of success are better if you're if you're stealing up. As opposed to like, um, I was uh, a while back. I was reading a, uh, a comic book for Battle of the Planets, and I was like, I loved the, the cartoon when I was a kid. And I was like, they made a comic book out of it. Let me see. The art was great, and like, they lifted this scene from Watchmen. And I'm like, you can't steal from Watchmen without people knowing. <laughs> like, if they had stolen from Battle of the Planets, nobody would have noticed. But you can't steal from Watchmen. What are you, what are you crazy? So yeah, you got to make sure which way you're stealing. <laughs> I'm curious as to, I mean, there's a couple of you in here, and just why, what prompted you to be here? Just, it was a place to be. I mean, I know a few of you have mentioned you have something you're wanting to pitch, or, well, this is, or this what is, other reasons are there? This is the first time I've been to a con, and Steve Zimmer Welcome. set it up, and he says, okay, you're to be in panel room, be at 6 o'clock. <laughs> okay. You know, and it just, it so happened, I mean, what you, I have done everything that you guys are talking about from, from, you start me off with wanting to think why is there never been a movie made from a Robert McCammon book? Mm -hmm. Swan Song. I mean, God, make a you know mini series or something out of it. And and, and <laughs> turning a screenplay going from movie to book. I did that when I was 13, and I didn't even know what I was doing. It's funny because they you know remember the Planet of the Apes <coughs> movies, right? Well, the, the first two books they had out, and then the third one, Escape from the Planet of the Apes, they never made a book. So that ticked me off. So I'm like, I watched the movie a hundred times. And I sat there and wrote the book, and I got it about 50 pages, and I got sidetracked. I don't know, a year or two later, two years later, the book comes out. Somebody made a novelization of the movie, and I compared my 50 pages to their first 50 pages, and they were almost identical. I'm like, God, it's like, it's like somebody copied something. So I, I felt good, hey, I, maybe I can write. <laughs> and, and the whole thing going from books to uh, my books to screenplays and the whole thing. So it worked out great just being here and hearing you guys talk about it And because I'm like, I have tried every bit of that, <laughs> you know? And I, I, I mean, I'm more in the horror fiction, Stephen King kind of thing is, is what I'm working over there. And I'm hearing a lot of science fiction and I know that that goes on. And I guess I'm gonna have to start reading some science fiction. Um, or not. But, well, <laughs> no, no, no. yeah, but it's, it's, it's getting do. hard. Yeah, my book, I got a book about, I, I make the guy a warlock only because I wanted somebody I could freeze at a certain age and then take him through time. I didn't know how else to do it. Well, I'll call him a warlock. Well, I'm having every fantasy person, whatever else, come over. Oh, a warlock, and, is, and is, is there a dragon? Is there this, that, that? No. This is a regular guy, you know, just going through time. He meets up with Jesse James, and he runs with Bonnie and Clyde, and he does all this other kind of stuff, you know? And so I, now I'm wondering if maybe I shouldn't have made him a warlock. But it, but. I need to read that other stuff so that I know, well, I you know, where the, where the crossover is and what's going on. I want had a character called Lazarus Long. He's one of the oldest men, oldest man in the universe. Mm, oh yes, yes. Lived yes, forever. Yes. Yeah. And he was a, the scion of a, of a line that had been developed over centuries. They had lengthened their their by genetic mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. choosing, 
that had picked the longest lived people to have children. And eventually it clicked and you got Lazarus Long. He just lived forever. So that, that's how my mind got around that particular. Yeah, can I keep going? Oh, yes, yes, too, and I, it's yes. like I got to read that too. <laughs> I, I, there's a lot of I have to read. Yeah. I spent this last year working my way through Robert McCain. It's like mm -hmm. I read him and I loved. It's like okay, I have to read everything that he wrote. You know, you know another thing too, though, you have to be a realist with the genres, with what's what's hot and what's not. Um, science fiction is always going to be a tough sell. Um, horror. It seems Zombies like hard. It's hard. It goes in spells right. where it can be really hot. Do, do you really think science fiction is is a hard sell? Because what I'm noticing at the moment is there are small. I think I think you're right. Back when CGI was 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 kind of controlling things because it could be very expensive. But what I've noticed over the last few years, uh, like Moon by Duncan Jones. Oh wow. There's this. Another Earth that's coming out shortly. Yeah. Now these are these are small personal science fiction and actually remind Primer. me of the sort of people in this book. You know, not blowing things up, not George Lucas style science fiction, which don't get me wrong is great, but it's a certain style and it can be very expensive. But the kind of stories like like the ones you're referring to and like the, like the sort of Heinlein stories you're referring to, and I sort of wonder if that might be the salvation of science fiction in the movies, that it doesn't have to be all huge budgets. There's going to be, there are going to be fans of movies. The, mm. the things are going to be hot. Right now zombies are hot. Right. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Vampires mm. Oh, I got a Walking Dead book too if you want to check it out. Okay. Okay. Right. 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 <laughs> well, like when Star Wars first came out, so when, when something comes out that does that good, everybody tries to piggyback mm. on it while it's still like mm. ride the wave type of thing. Yeah. Um, then you have the sci-fi channel. Some of the science fiction movies they put on there is a reason why it's difficult to get a good uh, sci-fi yeah, movie made. Yeah, yeah, People look at that, it's like, I'll never watch another sci-fi yeah, movie again. Yeah. Sci-fi channel, why do they do that? <laughs> why do they call themselves a sci-fi channel? I don't know. Where, where is well, plus now they're sci-fi. Well, yeah. because it's actually cheaper for them to produce that stuff than it is to license yeah. terminology. Yeah, yeah, I can yeah. see that. Yeah. That's for sure. Yeah, yeah. they just you well enough to make, make money. Shark to puss. Shark, did you make that thing for fifty thousand dollars over a weekend, <laughs> as opposed to the half a million dollars in, in royalty rights you got to pay for for a James Cameron film? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, how many people here saw Primer? Uh, Low budget, independent sci-fi. You're talking film? about the time travel? Yeah. Oh yeah. Gee whiz, that was peculiar. Wasn't it? Not a single special effect in that thing, but no. hardcore science fiction. Yeah, yes, yeah. Now, here's where you're also going to get into trouble in this genre is in that these are quasi, there are people who are hardcore. Science fiction technically is anything that takes a known scientific principle and extrapolates that what might be. First science fiction novel, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. She knew that electrical impulses powered the body. She figured if she gets this guy enough juice, she could bring him back to life. Science fiction. Whereas something like Star Wars, faster than like travel, that kind of thing, that's pure fantasy. It's fantasy. It's got it's a set dressing. It looks like science fiction, but it's Camelot in space. You've got a white and a black knight. You've got rescuing princesses. I mean, it's Camelot in space. Yeah. I'm sorry. You had a question. Uh, I was just going to mention another independent film. Has anyone seen Hunter Prey? No. You must see. It. No. Independent film. It's actually available on Netflix. Okay. Um, on I'm, I'm trying to think if it was a was an Australian company did it. No, I think it was a U.S. So. U.S. But um, same thing, fairly low budget, no big science fiction special effects, just wonderful story, acting, filmography, wonderful Pro. writing. I actually, I watched it on Netflix, and I honestly kind of went into it thinking it was going to be one of those cheesy B movie ones, because I really like those, I mean, I have a place in the, in the world, and I like them, like them. and then it just blew me away. Hunter Slash? Pray. Pray? Yeah. 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 Yep. Yep. Just and yeah. it was one of those where like I, if I was writing it, this is what I would do. And then they did it. You know, I was like, oh, it was just fabulous. I'm gonna take a quick left turn here. Just talking about great script. Get your hands on some South Korean cinema. And I say that because they have no budget at all. They are just now starting to make their foray into the science fiction market, but because they have no budget, they have to tell a good story. They've got nothing else to fall back on, so they have to write a good script. And like, without fail, every time I've watched a South Korean movie, I've been like, this is great. Yeah. Was it 
this is fantastic. Matter of fact, that uh, that horrible remake that they did, um, the Link House, Keanu Reeves and uh, oh, yeah. Sandra Bullock, yeah. is actually yeah. like a South Korean film called right. Omara. Yeah. Uh, so Great film. Some fantastic right. martial right. arts films, Korean films, mm. that have incredible scripts. It's not just right. an action film. Well, I, I mean, China is doing great stuff. The Departed was actually a remake of a uh, of a Chinese film called Infernal Affairs, and that's actually a film series over there. They have uh, Infernal Affairs one, two, three, and four. Notice that they're going overseas a lot. I mean, from The Ring, you know, all right. the way forward for the horror movies, uh, they've actually started tapping Japan for all the horror. Oh, yeah. so, you know. I was just really surprised that uh, that um, Martin Scorsese got an Academy Award for Best Director for The Departed. But it's, I, I swear to you, almost literally a shot-for-shot -shot remake mm -hmm. of the Chinese film. Mm -hmm. and I'm like, how do you get an Academy Award for copying somebody else's film? <laughs> I mean, like, yeah. no, I mean, literally, he's like players. looking at the DVD on a private monitor. He's like, all right, set the camera up here. Well, right no. here. I mean, how, many <laughs> awards, like how many awards did the Magnificent Seven get, you know? And now all that was was the Seven Samurai right. in a Western setting. That's all that was, so, you know. <laughs> Adaptation from screenplay to screenplay. Mm -hmm. So, anybody else got any questions? How much more time? Do any answers? <laughs> yeah. 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 I do like that you're talking about story because to me that's the bottom line. The novelizations I did were small market successes, but the one of them was made for under a million dollars and made thirty-three million at the box office. Nice. And and the bottom line to me is just a good story touches people. And it's like Moon. I mean, it may not make a you know ton at the box office, but for what it was made for, it was a success. Yeah. Yeah. And it connects with people because it's a good story. And I, I, I love to see people sitting here hoping that you guys will catch that passion for good story, not just, oh, if I get a big budget, I can blow well, things I, up. Yeah. I mean, I, I the science, give it out another the science fiction that I remember, <laughs> uh, the movies that I remember, are no. movies that, that weren't great successes. Mm -hmm. You know? Like Destination Moon. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It was written by Highland. Yeah, yeah. And what you know, it was a it was a box office flop. Mm -hmm. But I love the movie. Mm -hmm. But I love science fiction. Mm -hmm. I grew up loving the movie Rollerball. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. oh yeah. 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 A short story by Richard Matheson. Yeah. You watch that movie, and you'll see that the places where that movie falls down mm -hmm. is when they were trying to expand the short story into a feature yeah. length film. Yeah. 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 It's like the rest of the movie is great. But it's the places where they're just kind of trying to fill in, like, I don't know, let's have a little library. <laughs> but you also look at the time it came out, it was like a little bit ahead of its yeah. time. Yeah. I'm not kidding, it's yeah. the little library. Yeah. Of course, right. of course what you were saying about Destination Moon applies to Blade Runner, of course, which yeah. now, of course, you know, you've spoken in hushed tones. But when it first came out, it was a flop. Yes. You know? And it took a long time for critics and certain parts of the audience to really kind of get its head around what Ridley Scott was doing and how he was doing it, and possibly to the Philip K. Dick, you know, and now, of course, as you say, Slip probably smack his name on a, on a, right. on a screenplay, and you, it gets you through the door, at least. Is it know? safe to assume everybody here has seen Blade Runner? Mm -hmm. Has anybody not seen Blade Runner? Okay. <laughs> All right, when you, now, you, you think of Blade Runner, sometimes. <laughs> well, now, when you, when you think of Blade Runner, you have this very clear image of its look, right? Mm. The dark, rainy, mm. whole thing, right? Budgetary restriction. Yeah, yeah, clever. They ran out of money. They couldn't finish that street scene. So they're like, well, how are we going to cut down visibility? Well, let's just turn off the lights and make it rain. Yeah, all the time. Yeah, all the time. Yeah, that's just like that kind of creative clever. filmmaking clever. is one of the things that got me into that industry. Because yeah. it's just that, that, that kind of story, just yeah. that's what set me on fire. It's like, what can you do with less? George Lucas is a perfect example of what can you do with more. Mm. <laughs> no, he really is. If you had, no. if you had unlimited money, if you had to stop yeah. being creative. Yeah. When they had to be creative, Spielberg's duel. Right. Okay? When they had to be creative and they had a small budget, they could do it. Right. I and mean, then they could probably still do it. But they're given unlimited money. Yeah, I was, uh, that was just, like, uh, just well, thinking. That's why Lucas is the best. THX 138. Yeah, THX 138. This is the difference between Raiders of the Lost Ark and the Crystal Skull movie. Okay, in that first film, look, I don't care how much money you've got. My problem with that last film, aside from story, aside from the refrigerator thing, was the fact that you had 10,000 digital ants eating somebody alive that we all knew weren't there. Raiders of the Lost Ark, you had one giant styrofoam ball, but that thing was there. Somebody was actually running from it. 
the, it was there. You felt like you were in the moment. The, the digital stuff. Just, <laughs> we're running, we're but, running uh, away from the from the topic, but yeah. I don't. I'm sorry. I, no, but this is so much fun. I'm no, no, no. Although I don't know, you could you could say because we're talking about how to capture that involvement in a story when you're reading a story and having amps on you, and then seeing it on a screen and cartooning them in and <laughs> it losing something in the translation. You know, and because there is so much of that when you're reading a, a story in a book and then you're trying to visualize it on a screen, the two mediums, they have, they, you have to know what you're doing. Can you get close, but you can moment. get closer nowadays to what the novel says yeah. than you could, you know, 40 yeah. years ago. But they still, they're, they look at Harry Potter. Times overdo it. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> look at the Harry Potter oh, stuff. Now that's done well. Oh. Harry Potter, oh, yeah, Lord, Harry of Potter. Yeah. Lord of the Rings, yeah. 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 Lord of the Rings. Yeah. 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 Can, can you imagine how Tolkien would have felt if he'd actually yeah. seen the Lord of the Rings films that were produced recently? Oh, yeah. You know, it's Those just amazing. But still, they, a lot of times they just so much overdo it. And my, my problem with the computer animation or whatever it is that they're doing is when they, they have big characters or characters that are leaping and jumping and doing things, you do not feel the weight. I don't feel, you know, when I, this thing is hopping from here to here and this thing weighs like a thousand pounds or 500 pounds and he's like hopping like it's nothing and I'm like, I don't feel the weight of this person doing these kind of things and that really irritates me with a lot of them, most of them. They don't, they don't factor in the weight of the character that they're making hop and jump around and it's just, you don't feel it. Is, is anybody here interested in actual f making films? Filmmaking? Okay. Uh, if you haven't already, the, there's a couple of books I'll recommend to you. First and foremost among those is uh, Rebel Without a Crew, Robert Rodriguez's book. Um, one of the best pieces of writing advice I ever got was in that book. So when you're sitting down to write your screenplay, you take a, a, just a legal pad and write down everything you have access to. And nothing else. Like if you know your friend runs a bar and he's willing to let you shoot in there at 3 a.m. after they close down, you put that on the list. But if you don't, you don't. You know if you've got a 65 Mustang, if you've got a blue turtle, whatever you've got, you put it on the list. And when you start to write your script, you don't put anything in that script that isn't on the list. And that's it. That's your budget right there. And when like you look at Desperado, it's like, oh Mariachi, it's it's what he did. You know he worked from his list. And it's like. That is creative budgeting, and like you know, he he went on to do fairly good things. Mm -hmm. Can so. you do that the other way around though? It's like because I've I've written I've written five big screenplays, and I've got a, a local filmmaker that he's he's done one or he's done a couple, and we're talking about doing another one. And so I I didn't write mine for him to do that, but I thought after I wrote him, I thought, hey, I've got access to this guy, and we've done some stuff. So what could I take of mine and downplay it from what I wrote? Because I wrote, you know, your big Hollywood thing. Right. And I've done that. I mean, I've got one script that I'm looking like, okay, this is what I wrote, but how can we do it? Well, we can do it if we take this down and make it this and that. And I basically did what you're saying, only just the opposite right. backwards. Well, I say, I'll tell you that the first script that I had optioned um, was I wrote it specifically so that it would be $800,000 or less. Because... I'm an unknown quantity. Uh, you know, people don't know my name to go to the theater. You know, so I, I got to give them something that the story is good enough they're willing to take a chance on. It's only got an eight hundred thousand dollar budget or a million dollar budget. They're going to get some, you know, some soap opera, soap opera star to, to do this over a weekend. He's going to do a walk on part. You know, but it's like if you're trying to pitch this script for someone else to produce, you make it as easy a decision for them as possible. It's like. Here comes Michael with a million dollar script, and here comes you with a ten million dollar script. He wins. Thank you. Yeah, you know, yeah, well, I mean, it's you, want, you know, yeah. just a matter of uh, Kevin Smith, when he was doing stuff, like he did Clerks famously for $50,000 on credit cards. When, by the time he got to Jay and Silent Bob Strikes Back, they gave him a $15 million budget, and he was like, why? I don't I don't need fifteen million dollars. It's it's dick and fart jokes. Like, I, <laughs> like what do I need a budget for? And they're like, well, their thinking literally was that with fifty thousand dollars, he made fifty million dollars. If we give him more money, he'll make more money. money yeah. Exponentially, it should grow. Right, exponentially, it should grow, and that's why Jay and Silent Bob was a flop. Well, it's not the only reason. But yeah. Yeah, it was a bad movie. That's one. Right, it was a bad movie. But I mean, like. They, he made it very easy for them. Like, if you look at him historically, 
Kevin Smith is one of the greatest filmmakers of our time. He is one of the most successful filmmakers of our generation, simply because he makes films for less than nothing, and he makes a ton of money from them. Studios love it. Which is what George Lucas did with Star Wars. Right. Yes. And sometimes, too, you can, be, you can get too good at it for your own good. Uh, when I did the script for the Eye of Icarus, I sent a submission to uh, the Eisenberg Media Group. Joel Eisenberg, uh, he calls me up for one day, and we talked for about an hour, and he said, you know, he said, what made you write a story like this? And I said, well, you know, I always liked Independence Day, all the different subplots, everything they had going on, and I said, and I thought, I knew I could write something like that, you know, with that kind of complexity. He says, well, guess what? He goes, nobody's going to make it. And he said, most producers, they do it. he goes, it's very, very complex. And he pointed out to me, when they wrote Independence Day, Dean, Le Dean Devlin and Roland Emmerich, they wrote it together with uh, Emmerich being the producer. So they wrote what they wanted to do. Yeah. So for me to write it and expect somebody else to make it, he said, it's, he goes, it's very well written, but he goes, it's too well written. He goes, it's too much. He goes, too complicated for, you know, you know, producers want something simple. If they want to complicate it, they'll pump it up the way they want to. But they say, you, get, you know, start off with something a lot simpler. He goes, he goes, he goes, he goes it's well written, but he goes, it's not going to get made. So a novel, I, novel can be a novel can be very complex, but when you get onto a motion picture, you got to pick something yeah. and stick to it because you can't develop subplot after subplot after subplot. The people are going to forget where they are. In a novel, they they can follow. They go back a page. Could could I could I ask a panel whether you think the success of a Game of Thrones? might make a difference to the way people look on fantasy and science fiction because that's a very complicated story I and that you know um, if they killed off people I might <laughs> 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 he shouldn't have done that. I think the Game of Thrones is riding the Lord of the Rings. Yeah, yeah. Myself mm -hmm. personally. George R. R. Martin George R. R. Martin is an excellent writer, one of my favorites. And I don't know quantity. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. um, you know, I think it's just because the yeah, Lord of the yeah. Rings kind of thing is hot right yeah, now. Yeah. Also, I'll say that HBO has a great track record of producing miniseries that mm -hmm. do very, very well. Mm -hmm. Have you ever seen Rome? Mm -hmm. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Oh, excellent. Excellent. Rome was one of the greatest things I've ever seen on TV. Yeah, yeah. I was amazed yeah. at that. Yeah. Although, I don't understand why everybody in Rome was speaking with a British accent. Yeah. <laughs> that should have been like the cast from Goodfellas and Togas. <laughs> hey, yo, what are you kidding me? You two Brutus get that. <laughs> <laughs> That should have been Rome, right? Yeah, You're Italian. Absolutely. absolutely. Give me a break. <laughs> Forget about it. <laughs> that should have been the Senate. What do you think? Forget about it. Right. Anybody else have any more questions? We've got just a couple minutes left. Do you, do you know, do you think there's, I'm sorry. I didn't have a question. Go ahead. Well, I was just wondering, um, I know there have been, I can think of at least three Richard Matheson that were made. They made Bedtime Return into Somewhere in Time. They made, um, uh, what uh, was it? What things may come? I'm trying to remember the title. The one with the heaven hell thing with oh, Robin yeah. Williams, and then I of course I am Legend. Uh, Why? And and I know there's he writes very because I'm a fan of his. He writes very full, very detailed books as opposed to Philip K. Dick that's so stark you don't know the color eyes right. or the anything about. He could be anybody. His characters are just. When I've read the short stories that the movies were based on, after I saw the movies, I was just amazed. And I've always thought that the reason that possibly that Philip K. Dick was continually so popular with screenwriters is they could paint their own picture. That he he didn't steal their palette. He gave them an outline. Where Matheson does this complete full palette that I think is very difficult to follow. I don't know if that has part of it because I didn't think that Billy Dick is all that much more. I know he's very popular, but you know the Matheson with modern readers. I, I think well, Matheson I think still the, sells too. The reason Dick was so popular is because a lot of people like me. I like stark fiction. I don't like to be uh, burdened down when I read with a lot of detail, except when I'm reading horror. If I'm reading horror, then I like Lovecraft. I like a lot of detail in my horror. But in my science fiction, I want just the facts, man. So that's when I read science fiction. Philip K. Dick was the one I'd read. If I read fantasy, I'd read a Tolkien or Martin or something like that. My, it's just my, taste. my two cents on this would simply be that you're also dealing in an industry of ego. One of the pieces of advice that I got when I was writing screenplays that I was sending out for other people to produce was that you want to leave them something to put their name on. You know what I mean? When you're writing that screenplay, don't write it as though you were directing the film. 
You give them the story and let them put, you know, you let them paint it, but you provide the house. You know, you're giving them the framework. And let them put the doors and shutters on themselves. So, I mean, something like Matheson, it might be all there for you. I mean, just like that. Ranking in, in, in groups of people, larger or smaller size, people who want to just go and see things blow up or are concerned with, like I'm real into good dialogue. I love, I can sit and watch two guys sit at a table for a half an hour if that dialogue back and forth is excellent. I love it. My wife can't do that. You know, two minutes into it, she's out of the room. But I, I'm, I'm just, if, if, like you say, the story is real good or the dialogue is real good. There doesn't even have to be almost anything else going on. But it, it, so is, is, is one bigger than the other or it's just who the contact you get in touch with that wants to make that kind of movie? It's really just what they want to make. Yeah. And it's also, you know, like if I tell you that I've got a, a movie pitch, um, you know, but if I give you my, my elevator pitch, you know, you're a producer, I say, I got, a, I got a story about two guys who hate each other. One guy slept with the other guy's wife. They're trapped in an elevator in a building <laughs> where the power went out. Wow. This is the movie for two hours. I've locked down <laughs> one set. Yeah. You know, I've seen that movie. Right? But now, I tell you that this is a John Woo film. We want John Woo attached. Forget it. John Woo can't shoot two guys in an elevator for two hours. One of them's going to be dead in the first five minutes after a ballet of blood, and there's going to be a dove in there somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> and they're right? going to be facing each other with guns. Right, exactly. Yeah. They, for those first five minutes, and then someone dies. Aaron Sorkin can write the hell out of that. All Aaron Sorkin does is dialogue. I would, let, I would watch that movie if it was a four-hour miniseries on HBO. Like, really? Two guys in a room? Wasn't that the West Wing? Yeah. Anyway. So I mean, it's just you got to find out where you, where your project will fit best, and talk to people who do find that kind that of thing. Person, yeah. yeah, like if it's a big loud in your face thing, talk to the people who are doing Michael Bay films. <laughs> no, seriously, I, you know, what's the story of a Michael Bay film? There's a story. <laughs> it's, Explosions. You know, stuff blows up. Explosions. We and like that. Count. We're Americans. We like blowing stuff up. <laughs> Every movie made by an American nowadays ends up with something blowing up. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> All right, anybody any last? Uh, you know, it's like you said that they, you know, you can take some of those things and you just see a ton of money being thrown into it, and then you come up with somebody who's got a good story. That, you know, not necessarily cheap, but it's like, you know, no, they don't want to make that investment. They don't have the money for that. Yeah, like, think, but they just I spend think, the money on this piece of yeah. crap over here that they're blowing up yeah, the whole world. Yeah. So uh, I think the panel has come up with some pretty good answers to my original question. Yeah. 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 All right, folks. Well, thanks for joining us. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.